Man, it's exciting to be with you this morning. I'm excited to be here. I love church. Oh, is anybody else excited to be in church today? Come on. Come on. Get the blood pumping. It's a good day to be in church. Was anybody here for our Fresh Wind uh, spiritual service this week? Man, it was good. It was good. We're excited about what God is doing in and through this church. And we capped off our Holy Spirit series with Spiritual Emphasis Week. And if you missed it, hey, I just want to say hello to the online family mask service. If you missed any any of the Spiritual Emphasis Week, like Pastor Jeff said, those are going to be on YouTube uh, soon. I'm hoping uh, by the end of the day tomorrow. So we are so happy. We are so excited for what God is doing in and through our church family and and we did a whole series on the holy spirit talking about who he is and and the power that he gives us and and how we need and should be filled every day uh, to live our daily lives we need to be filled uh with the presence of the holy spirit and we had an amazing week of services and sessions emphasizing the holy spirit and his power and and being filled with his presence and we had amazing altar moments and and prayer services where we watched god move in mighty ways through this family but now what? Now what do we do? Now what happens? The services are over. Pastor Manny went home. Uh, Pastor, or Dr. Wave went home. We're not meeting here every night of the week any longer. The services are over. But that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit has stopped moving. So when we ask the question, now what? I believe that God is asking us a question and it's can I get a witness? When we ask God, what do we do now? What do we do now? God is asking us, is there anybody who is willing to be my witness? Is there anybody who is willing to tell my story, to reach out to lost people, to reach out to broken people, to reach out to dying people? And I believe that God, he is asking us, will you tell my story? Will you tell my story? And so today we're starting a new series where for the next couple of weeks we'll be answering this question, now what? Now, do I, now what do I do? Specifically this morning we're talking about telling his story, him being Jesus. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 16. We're going to start in verses 13, read through uh, verse 20. This is about Peter, the apostle. Uh, we all remember Peter. If you don't know who Peter is, Peter is believed to be the oldest disciple, the smartest disciple, the wisest disciple. He's also the one who uh, we have recorded of his mistakes multiple times, right? Because if you're going to be the greatest, everybody's going to know what you do wrong. Hello, come on. And Peter, so this is Peter, this is Jesus and Peter are having a conversation, and it's actually Jesus and all of the disciples, Peter's just very eager to answer the question, and it says this in, in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And then Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. And in verse 20, Jesus does this. He sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Sternly warned the disciples to tell, and not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Jesus asked his disciples, who do the people say that I am? Who are people 
in society saying that I am? Who are people out in the streets, out in the grocery stores, out in the community, who are they saying that I am? It's a weird question for Jesus to ask. Jesus is the son of God. We believe he's a 100% God and a 100% man. He's got divine knowledge through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a weird question for Jesus to ask. If one of us asked that question, people would be like, you're a little bit narcissistic. Why do you care what people are saying about you, okay? You're not that great, right? But Jesus asks this question. Who are the people saying that I am? And we need to understand something that when Jesus asks a question in the Bible, he's not asking the question so that he can learn some new piece of information because Jesus already knows the answer. When Jesus asks a question in the Bible, he needs us to learn something from the answer. And what he needed his disciples to know in that moment, he needed them to have a pulse on society. He needed them to be in the world and not of the world. He needed them to know what the people around them are saying. He needed them to be in places and spaces where they are talking about Jesus, but they have the wrong answer. Do you know what that means? He's telling the disciples right there in this moment with this question, you need to stop just hanging out with each other and you need to get out into the world. You need to know what people are saying about me. You need to be able to answer the question, what are the people saying about me? Who do they say that I am? Church, we need to be people who are in the world having conversations about Jesus with people who do not have the correct answer. It's so easy to get caught up in the church bubble, to be around believers and only believers because we wanna stay straight, we wanna stay on the path. But Jesus says, if you are following me and if you have been empowered by the Holy Spirit, you need to walk into the darkest places of this world. You need to walk into the lost regions, to the lost people, and you need to have conversations with them. So he asks his disciples, who do the people say that I am? And they answer the question, well, you know, you're, some people say that you're John the Baptist. Some people say that you're Elijah. Some people say that you're Jeremiah or one of the great prophets from old. He needs them to know that people have the wrong answer. Why? Because he asks them a follow-up question, okay? So that's who people are saying that I am, but who do you say that I am? He asks them a follow-up question because he needs them to know the right answer. If people all around you are saying that, uh, are, 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 they have the wrong answer, they're saying that I'm somebody that I'm not, then you, you need to have the right answer. So who do you say that I am? And here comes Peter. Here comes Peter. Remember, these are the people who are closest to Jesus. They've seen the miracles. They've heard the teachings. They've been intimate witnesses to Jesus' life. They literally watched the man sleep. I want you to just take yourself into the scenario of the disciples crossing the boat and the storm comes and they're like, where's Jesus? Oh, he's sleeping. How do they know that? Because they all walked down below deck and they're standing there watching the man sleep. It's weird. That's how intimately they knew Jesus. That's how close they were to Jesus. He's asking these people. It's extremely important that you know who I am, so who do you say that I am? And Peter, here comes Peter with the concrete truth. You are the Messiah. Jesus, you are the son of the living God. I'm gonna be honest with you. If I was Peter, I would not have been the first one to volunteer my answer. Because for those of us that know, just a couple chapters earlier in Matthew 14, Peter starts walking on the water, volunteers to walk on the water. Recognize this, Jesus didn't ask him to step, he didn't say, hey Peter, do you want, Peter said, yo, if it's you, let me walk on the water. So Peter volunteers to walk on the water and what happens, he begins to sink. And then he's embarrassed in front of all of his friends, right? This is like, you know, if you're at a basketball game and there's like, you know, a few thousand people in the arena watching the basketball game and you're the one that gets called to come down and do the half court shot for a million dollars, you know what I'm talking about? And you're hyped up, you're like, oh, I got this. 
You don't even know. I shoot hoops every day, okay? I got a hoop in my driveway. It's connected to my garage. I got this. And you walk out there and you miss the shot. You hit the rim. That's embarrassing. In front of all these people, that's exactly what happened with Peter. He's embarrassed. He fell in the water. He began to sink. And if I was Peter, I wouldn't have volunteered to answer the next question from Jesus. Who do you say that I am? I would have been like, I'm going to let somebody else take this one. I've already been embarrassed. I don't need to do this again. But no, he doesn't do that. Because I believe that there is something so overwhelming in our bones that when we know the truth about who Jesus is, when we know how good he is like we just sang, when we know how faithful he is, when we know the miracles that he's done, there is something so overwhelming in our bones that when we know the truth about Jesus, we cannot contain it inside of ourselves. Peter could not contain himself. I imagine that when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Peter was like, you are the Messiah. You are the son of God. Hallelujah. There is something so overwhelming when we know the truth about who Jesus is that we cannot contain it to ourselves. And Peter says, you are the Messiah. You are the savior. You are the anointed one from the line of David sent here to rescue us from the bondage of sin and death. You, Jesus, are the rescuer and you are here. And if he would have stopped there, if he would have stopped with you are the Messiah, everybody would have understood. Everybody would have understood. Yeah, you're right. We know who the Messiah is supposed to be. And Jesus so far has fulfilled everything that the Messiah needs to be. We get it. We understand. But Peter takes it a step further. Because when God's goodness is running after us, we can't help but tell the whole truth. We can't help but tell the whole story. And so Peter takes it a step further and says, not only are you the Messiah, but you are the son of the living God. Come on, somebody. We do not believe in a dead God created by human thought or action. We believe and we know it to be true that our God is the creator. He spoke the world into motion. It's his breath that sustains the life in our lungs and because of his love for us he sacrificed his one and only son on a cross and it's his blood that courses through our veins is there anybody who can testify about the goodness of Jesus this morning in that moment in that moment Peter became a witness in that moment Peter became a witness, a witness of what he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt to be true. And based on that truth, based on the truth about who Jesus is, Jesus begins to change Peter's life. On that truth, on that truth, Peter, on that rock, on that concrete truth, that foundational truth that I am the Messiah, that I am the son of the living God, Peter, on that truth, you're going to begin something. You're gonna start a domino effect. You are going to begin to build the church. You and every other disciple here, you're going to begin to build my church. And the Bible says the powers of hell, other translations call it the gates of hell, cannot stand against the church. Please understand, it does not say that the powers of hell might not be able to stand against the church, that if you're having a bad day, you're gonna fall to the powers of hell. It does not say that. It says the powers of hell cannot stand against the church. Do you know who the church is? It's not a building, it's you, it's me. The church are the people whose lives are rooted in the truth of who Jesus is. The church are the people who carry the spirit of God inside of them. The church are the people who walk out into dead and dying broken spaces and tell his story. The church are, are the people who follow Jesus day in and day out, not just on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night. Do you know what that means? 
That means that Christians, followers of Jesus, people who are rooted in the truth, we have the opportunity and the authority to storm the darkness and rescue lost souls who have bought into the lie of the enemy. I love that it says the gates of hell cannot stand against the church. Do you know why? Because gates don't move. Gates are attached to a fence. Gates are not following you down the street. You have to go to where the gates are. So if the gates of hell aren't going to stand against the church, where's the church going to be? Storming the gates of hell, pulling lost souls back to the light. Oh, that should get some people fired up this morning. That should get some people excited to know that I have been given the opportunity and the authority to reach into the darkest places of my community, to the loved ones that are so far gone right now, but they are not too far gone to be saved. I have been given the opportunity and the authority, just like Peter, to storm the gates of hell and rescue lost souls out of the grip of Satan. Real life, consistent Daily, Jesus followers have the opportunity and the authority to look evil square in the face and say, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that my God is greater than your power. So in the name of Jesus, you cannot stay here. In the name of Jesus, you have no power here. We have been given the opportunity and the authority. And then Jesus says something very curious in verse number 20. He says this, Jesus sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. That doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. Wouldn't you want the world to know? Wouldn't you want us to go tell everybody, Jesus, why are you sternly warning your disciples in that moment after you've given them the opportunity and the authority to go out and storm the darkness and storm the gates of hell and use them to rescue lost souls? Why would you tell them not to tell anyone that they are the Messiah? Why did Jesus make such a huge statement about what Peter said and then tell them not to tell anybody? It's because in that moment, Right there, in that moment, in Matthew chapter 16, he gave them the opportunity and he gave them the authority, but he had yet to give them the power. Do you know what that means? That without the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we are ineffective witnesses. Without the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we cannot tell his story. It's exactly what he tells Peter. That's exactly what he tells his disciples. You have the opportunity, you have the authority, but you need to wait until I give you the power. I think that there's nothing coincidental about our God. And I, I think that it's not ironic that Jesus has this encounter with Peter in front of all the other disciples. And it, it's all because I believe he knew exactly what was going to happen after his, after his resurrection on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two. We just got done talking about this in our Holy Spirit series. On Acts chapter, in Acts chapter two, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls on the believers like a rushing wind with tongues of fire. Back in Matthew, Matthew 16, where we're at right now, Jesus opens the door of opportunity and he grants them the authority. But now in Acts chapter two, on the day of Pentecost, he pours out his spirit and he endows them with power to go into all the world to tell his story. Friends, the same command is on our lives today. The door of opportunity has been flung wide open. We have been given the authority and he has poured out his spirit on all believers and given us the power. So the question this morning is, can I get a witness? Is there anybody in the house who is willing to be a witness to tell his story? Is there anybody in the house who can testify about the goodness of God, the goodness that chases after us? Is there anybody in the house who is willing to walk into dark places and shine bright the light of Jesus Christ? I'm excited. 
When the Holy Spirit fell, I don't believe that it was a coincidence that it was Peter who stood up and began to preach and tell Jesus' story. The Bible says in Acts chapter two, it outlines his entire sermon and I'm just gonna take some select verses starting in chapter two, verse 22. It says, Peter is now talking to the people who have heard them speaking and praying in tongues in a heavenly language, in a prayer language. He begins preaching to the people and he says this, people of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him, right here in verse 24. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. Move down to verse 32. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted in the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand, and the Father as he has promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us just as you see and hear today. Peter goes on in verse 36. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified to be both Lord and Messiah. And the people who were listening to his words about Jesus, their hearts were pierced and they said to one another, brothers, what should we do? What should we do? Peter tells his story. He tells Jesus' story. And the words of Jesus' story do not push people away. But it invites them into a new life with new glory and a new family. What should we do? It's not a coincidence that it was Peter who spoke the truth about who Jesus is in small group. And then it was Peter who, when he received the anointing, when he received the power, stood up and told the truth to thousands. Church, this is our moment. The Holy Spirit has been poured out. The Holy Spirit is here. His presence is with us. We have been filled with power, we have been given the authority. The door of opportunity is wide open. And this is our time as a church family to stand up and say, I will be a witness. I volunteer. I will tell the story of Jesus. I will storm the gates of hell. I will be a light in the darkness. I will reach out in love and compassion to lost souls. And I will let Jesus work through me to reach them, no matter what the cost. This is our time, church. This is our time. I need you to recognize this truth this morning. This building, this life, this book means absolutely nothing if we are not committed and obedient to what Jesus was committed and obedient to, and that is seeking and saving the lost. Even if we never see the harvest, Even if we never see the loss that we have been telling the stories to come to faith in Jesus. We call that in church world planting seeds and watering seeds. We have to be committed and obedient to the business of planting the seed of faith and watering the seed of faith. No matter how long it takes, no matter what it costs us, no matter if we never see the harvest, We have been called, we have been commissioned, and we have to choose to be obedient. I read an article the other day about a Christian who put up a billboard in his town, and this billboard said, describe Christianity in one word. Describe Christianity in one word. And then he put his cell phone number underneath the the text and said, send me a text message with your answer. Describe Christianity in one word. You're about to get offended. The responses that he got, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of responses from one town in America that this man got said this, judgmental, rude, arrogant, hateful, untrustworthy, unforgiving, so on, so forth. Thousands of responses, all the same. Is that who Jesus is? Do you know a Jesus that is judgmental, rude, arrogant, hateful, unforgiving, untrustworthy? 
Or do you know a Jesus that is good beyond all measure, that has given us faith and peace that passes all understanding? Because if that's the Jesus that we know, then why do people see something different in us? If we can sing songs like, God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. If we can sing songs like, your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. Your goodness is running after me. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. And whatever, my Lord, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. If we can sing songs like that in church, we should be able to say words like that outside of this building so that lost souls will see Jesus in us us we have to tell his story we have to tell his story there's a quote worship team you can come there's a quote by saint Teresa of Avila a saint in the catholic church from uh, I believe she lived in the 1500s she is quoted as saying this Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth, but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Christ has no body now on earth, but yours. We are his hands and his feet. We are his mouthpiece. There are some of you sitting in this room today that have gone to church for your entire life. You know his story like the back of your hand. You've read this book multiple times. You are the saints of the church. You need to share his story. Grandparents in this room, people who have been here for decades upon decades, You are not done. If you have breath in your lungs and blood in your veins, you have a mission, you have a command to share the story of Jesus, to talk about his goodness, to reach out in love and compassion. Young people in this room, you have been commanded to encounter Jesus and tell people his story. But you cannot tell a story of something that you do not know, of someone you do not know, that's called lying. To talk about something that you've never experienced, that's lying. And I will go so far to say this, you will be ineffective in telling the story of Jesus if you do not encounter him on a daily basis. Pastor Weaver a few weeks ago told us we should be eating a spiritual meal three times a day three times a day. I don't believe that he said that to shame us. I believe he said that to challenge us as a church who loves the world and loves Jesus to reach out to lost and broken people. This is a missional church. This is a church that believes in missions all around the world, but we also need to be a church that believes in the mission right here in our community. There are lost souls down the street, family. They need to know Jesus. We are the people. We are the saints. We are the followers of Jesus. If we don't share the story, who's going to? If we don't share the story, who's going to? Nobody in this room gets a pass today. All of us, every single one of you, if you have a relationship with Jesus, you have been commanded and mandated to walk out into the darkest reaches of this world and express and show the love of Jesus Christ to every person you come in contact with. Nobody gets a pass today. 
unless you don't know Jesus, and I would love to introduce him to you here in a moment. But if you are here this morning, and you would say, Pastor August, I know Jesus. I've known him for a long time. Then you, you have a mission. The question should no longer be, now what? Now what do I do? Now that I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, God, what do you want me to do now? The, per the question should be, who's next? Who do I need to share your story with next? When I go to work tomorrow, Jesus, who is there? Who are you giving me opportunity to share with? Who needs to know your story? We can't be witnesses of something we don't know and haven't experienced. We need to be Christians who are witnesses of God's goodness instead of witnesses of other people's flaws. The woman at the well is a perfect example of this. Why do they think Christians are judgmental? Because we learn about people's flaws and we share them with other Christians. I can say that I grew up in church. I've been here my whole life. I've been a part of it. I've done it. Maybe y'all are better than me. Y'all didn't come to my church, that's fine. Y'all might be better than me. But the woman at the well had an encounter with Jesus and he told her everything she ever did wrong. Everything she ever did wrong. But her words when she went to her town were, I need to tell you about this man named Jesus that I met because he is the Messiah, I believe. He knew everything wrong about me, but his words did not fill me with shame and guilt. His words filled me with hope for the future. Friends, your words about Jesus should not be pushing people away from the church. It should be inviting them into the family that you can have hope for your future if you would just, if you would just meet Jesus. Real quick, three things that kill our witness, gossip, pride, and selfish desires. Gossip changes our view of people from compassion to judgment and bitterness. And we like to use good Christian phrases like, but I need to be able to pray effectively, so I need to know all of the details of everything you've ever done wrong. No, you don't, that's gossip. That's gossip. I, honestly, I would rather not know what you did wrong. I would rather just pray for you. I don't want my view of you to be skewed. I wanna see you the way Jesus sees you. I wanna see you as a person with a, with a purpose and a sacred identity found in him. Gossip will kill your witness. Gossip will turn you judgmental and bitter. Pride, pride will kill your witness. Pride says, I know exactly what you need more than you do. So before I tell you about Jesus, before I introduce you to Jesus, let me tell you my opinion. Let me tell you about how I think you should live. Your opinion is not as important as God's truth. Plain and simple. Yeah, but Pastor August, I've been following Jesus forever and I know this, that, uh, I get it. But if it's your opinion, it's not as important as God's truth. Plain and simple. I'm not telling you that you should uh, be in agreement with the way every person lives their life. Their truth is their truth, my truth is my, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you need to be able to reach out in love and mercy and grace and compassion the way that Jesus reached out to you in love and mercy and grace and compassion and tell people his story that invites them into the family instead of your opinions. Your opinion is not important, it's not as important as God's truth and his love. Last, our selfish desires blind us to the needs of other people because we're so focused on God meeting our own wants. If your prayer time, your quiet time is consumed with asking God for something for yourself, you miss the point. That means you don't trust that God will take care of your every need. Because if we trust that God will take care of our every need, then we'll be about his business and that is reaching lost people. I had a pastor challenge me one time. I was, I was frustrated, I'm not hearing God, I'm not feeling God's presence like I used to. I, I'm, not, I'm so frustrated with God, he doesn't care about me. And this pastor looked at me and said, have you been praying for people or are you just praying about yourself and what you want? I didn't answer the question, I didn't wanna be embarrassed, but I knew within my heart that I, I spent my prayer time asking God for selfish things. When God was trying to say, trust me, 
I will give you everything you need. I will provide everything you need. Trust me and be about my business. Trust me for yourself and reach out to lost people. Trust me with your life and then spend your life telling people my story and I'll meet you right there. Your words and your actions should line up and show people who Jesus is in your life. Stand with me this morning. I'm gonna open up these altars for you. I'm gonna open up these altars for you because I believe that all of us need to have an encounter with Jesus. And today, if you need to have an encounter with Jesus that you can share about, I'm asking you to respond by coming down to the front and talking to Jesus. If you're here this morning and you need to encounter Jesus and his goodness and his love and mercy for the very first time, I'm asking you to come to my, my left over here in this front section. We're gonna be there to pray with you. I would love to introduce you to Jesus for the very first time. Just come talk to me, Pastor Jeff. We would be there, we would love to pray for you. Maybe you're in this room this morning and you were like me. You had a bad attitude towards God. You had a bad attitude towards lost people. And this morning you need an attitude adjustment. That's okay. That's actually really good to say I need an attitude adjustment. I'm challenging you to come down here, to come to the altar and say, Jesus, I need an attitude adjustment this morning. I repent. That means that I'm asking for forgiveness from it and I'm leaving it here and walking out without it. And if you're willing to say, Jesus, use me to be your witness in every situation, I'm challenging you to respond in a moment of surrender by coming down to the altar. And as we worship, we're gonna sing a song for just a few moments. As we worship, tell Jesus, my life is yours. I wanna be your witness. I'm ready to tell people. Show me who I need to go to. Give me opportunity, God, give me the power. So if you need to respond to one of those things, I'm gonna pray. And then I'm gonna open these altars and you can come down and respond how you need to respond. But you cannot share Jesus' story if you don't know him and haven't encountered him ever or in a long time. Would you pray with me this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that we would be people, we would be people who witness, we would be people about your business, we would be people who share your story, we would be people who care about the lost and dying broken in our world and we would be people who reach out to them. God, I am asking you this morning that we would be people who break down barriers in our lives so that we can reach lost and broken people. Jesus, move in this place. Holy Spirit, speak. It's in your mighty and holy name we pray. Everybody said, amen. Respond how you need if you need to come down to this altar. We would love to pray with you.